Hello, I'm Casey Zednik in DE Tools of Nginx. I want to talk to you today about why and how to run your own GitLab runners. I'm going to cover what are GitLab runners, understanding the cost of having your own runner fleet, how you design it, and then making sure that your fleet meets your business needs. What is GitLab? GitLab is a complete development platform. It allows you to store your source code, have your issues and your product plans, but more importantly, it has a CI CD feature. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That is the part that builds your code. I also want to point out it has a community edition open source version. What are GitLab runners? GitLab runners is the name for two ideas. There is the runner that talks to the GitLab instance that you're used to interacting with. It's the web part or when you do a Git push. It gets the jobs from the API and gives them to another idea is the executor. The executor does the actual work. Think like go build. And here in this diagram, we're showing our GitLab SaaS. And then in our cloud, we have the runner talking to the API and then handing off uh, jobs to the ephemeral VMs. Why would you run your own runners? Well, if you're using the open source on-prem version, you're going to have to. But even if you're using the SaaS version, which comes with minutes on the free tier of 400 or on the ultimate tier, 50,000, there's still reasons why you'd want to, including cost. First, let's go through the um, availability. So availability, if you're using the GitLab SaaS, they are hosted in Google's cloud. Now, your resources are probably in Azure or AWS. This creates an issue of cross-cloud availability, which impacts runner uh, stability and your times for your build. In addition, if you're using your own runners, you can diagnose and mitigate issues without having to create support tickets or waiting uh, for someone else to solve the problem. Also, security. While GitLab SaaS uses a VM once and then destroys it, there has been times where there has been runner configuration issues and uh, bugs that have allowed various tenants pipeline variables to leak into other uh, runners' jobs. Last, if you control the VM, the executor and the runner, it can increase your uh, supply chain security. Another one is features. GitLab has one basic runner type for Intel's, and it is two CPU and eight gigs of RAM. Now, you might be able to build your code on a smaller runner, or you might need even a larger one. For instance, we have a high compute, high CPU runner for long running tests. Last, cost. The retail price at GitLab minutes is about 60 cents an hour. Now, you can't say that's comparable to exactly what a VM costs, and we'll get into why that is. Understanding costs of a runner fleet. Like we're talking about GitLab is about 60 cents an hour, and you can probably get a comparable VM from a cloud provider for 10 cents an hour, but you can't do an apples to apples comparison here. There's some costs that we have to consider. First, there's fixed costs. Your time is setting up and configuring things. The compute and storage for the runner itself, that's the long lived process. You're gonna to want to also get those runner logs and metrics and put them into a system like OpenSearch. So you'll need uh, compute and storage for that. And then there's your VM costs for the actual jobs. So how can we think about this then um, before we design something to see if it's affordable and meets the needs? Well, here's a simple forecast I'm going to walk through here. The main things to pay attention to here are we are looking about how many hours do we need here for build time. So you might look at your previous month and see how many hours that you spent uh, running build jobs. For us, and this is just examples. I've picked a number. It's about 1,000. Uh, and then down in the details. For comparison, I've added the GitLab uh, runner, which is 60 cents an hour. But I want to caution, we can't do a direct comparison, but put it out there just to think about. In this situation, I'm showing 
a small, medium, and large runner. Like I talked about, some of the times you wanna right size your runner. So we found this smaller runner works for 90% of our workloads. So we're modeling that for 90% of our hours, we're going to use this runner, and then we're gonna use a slightly larger runner for 10% of our time. Now, the other the extra large runner, we're saying 0%, that's for one-offs. What's important to think about though is also your idle count. So this allows you to service your jobs quickly, but it costs you money. And that's where we kind of model that in the overhead here. So we're saying that 15% of your VM hours are lost to overhead. So this simple example here, we have a thousand hours um, using 90% of uh, the jobs on the smaller runner with an idle count of 10 to make sure jobs launch quickly, works out to about $800 a month. Whether that's a good cost or not, well, let's take a look over here. So the per job hour ends up being about 45 cents um, fully loaded here for the smaller runner, but $3.40 for the larger runner, which is kind of a lot more expensive than GitLab's runner cost. So how do we optimize those to get the cost down? So why was one of those much less expensive and the other one much more per hour? Well, it comes down to three things, the idle count. And so, and then also the size of the runner. So how expensive is the resource? And then how many are you have available for your idle pool? So GitLab has a feature to scale your idle count by time of day. In this example, I'm showing that our default runners have no idle count. That means there is nothing, there's no VMs created and being billed to us um, by default. However, here we look, we get into our business hours and then we have five runners that are now five uh, executors and VMs that are ready to take jobs. And that's costing money, even if they're not being used. Now we have a scaling factor here that says, if there is load in the system, go up to at least 40 uh, idle machines to make sure that jobs are served quickly. And in more detail, we see here that in peak times, what you'll see with your workloads is there's usually peaks and valleys. For us, we find that midday, we have the most demand. So we scale up our idle count even higher to make sure we keep our jobs running quickly. So let's look into key parts of Fleet Designer. So we've talked about like, what is GitLab? And that is, in a lot of people, that's the GitLab instance. You're probably quite familiar with that. You've interacted with it. We've talked about the runners, which is actually two ideas. There is the control part of the runner that talks to the API to get jobs and then hands it off to the executors. It does the real work. So this is what we're going to think again, go build in a Docker container. Hosting the runner. So this is the control part. Uh, it's a long running process. You could run it on any server you have or like in a Docker Compose container. We run it in one of our Kubernetes clusters. And while you can run uh, multiple executors with one runner long process, we have one runner, one executor. Why do we do this? Well, it allows us to update configurations um, very specifically. So if we want to change our small executors configuration, we don't have to uh, change or interrupt anything with the medium and large. So here's an example uh, of us having a namespace uh, in Kubernetes that is for the small runner and it's creating a pod and it's running the GitLab image for us. Okay, so that's the control part. Let's talk about the compute. The compute here is the part that is going to do the actual work. Now there's two main auto-scaling executors that GitLab has. I'm gonna cover the Docker plus machine one because that's what we use, but I wanna call out the Kubernetes list. It has some features that are really nice and some uh, problems that make it not easy to use in a general purpose way. So first is it's quicker to start jobs. And that's because the VMs are already up and you just have to place the container into a pot. It's really quick. But the same reason, it's hard to use Docker and Docker. And if your workloads like ours use a lot of Docker and Docker, 
you have to work around that because you can't directly contact the Docker daemon on the Kubernetes pod because it would interrupt Kubernetes itself. So we use Docker Machine. It's fairly quick to launch jobs if you have a good idle pool. Um, but one of the main things about it is that it has high isolation. And that is because each job gets a VM that then runs a container. So that means that if there was any issue with breaking out of the container, or if you need to talk to the Docker daemon, you have the whole VM to yourself. Let's go through the life cycle real quick though. What does that look like? So the first thing is you have to, the executor calls out to your cloud API and creates the VM. Once the VM is created, the executor makes sure that the OS and the SSH and Docker are set up, pulls across your building. So when using Docker plus machine, you have to have a build container that is going to have your tool chain. And think of like maybe your Go tool chain. Then set up scripts around getting your environment variables from your pipeline in there. And then finally, uh, checking out your code. Your job script is ran, so that might be like go build. Once it's done, the container exits. Now, depending how you have it configured, the VM will be destroyed. So like that's how GitLab SAS does it. So they don't want to have anybody share a previous machine. Now we run ours um, multiple times because we're in the same security uh, context. And so we are okay with having another job run on there. And then we get to amortize the creation cost. Well, after you've created this, you're going to need to support your users. And how do we do that without having a bunch of ad hoc queries to ourselves of like, my job isn't working. Why is this happening? Well, the easiest way to make sure you don't have those inbound questions is to use site reliability engineering principles. And there's some basic idea around SRE principles. And it's a mnemonic of valet, volume, availability, latency, errors, and tickets. Now, we're not going to cover tickets here. I'm going to assume that you have a way of people creating tickets or a Slack channel where people can get a hold of you. But let's go through the details of the other parts um, of these valet that helps us establish service level objectives. And that's, what, that, what does that mean? Is it, are we delivering to our developers and the business what they need? So first is volume. It can, how many jobs do you need to support? If you're smaller, you don't need to support that many. If you're larger, a lot. In fact, you have to think about CPU caps in your region. Uh, so for instance, we've had to raise CPU caps to make sure we can meet our volume. Uh, now our service level uh, objective around volume is that we're going to use 45% of our compute capacity 99% of the time. That allows for enough overhead so when there is heavy development towards releases or if someone kicks off a job with many uh, asynchronous uh, jobs in there, that there's capacity for it. Next is availability. And this one's really important because our developer hours are very precious. So we wanna make sure that the system's there for them. But it's hard to kind of describe availability in a system like this. It's, it's rarely just broken and doesn't work. It could be that you kicked off your pipeline, but your job didn't start for five minutes. Is that up or is that down? For us, that's down. So we define up as that your job has started under in under 300 seconds, 99% of the time. Next kind of like availability is latency. And this is, the, does it feel snappy? Does it make a joyful experience? This is where the developer, when they submit their code, how long does it take for that first job to start? Well, we want our developers to keep, you know, their concentration on what they're doing. So we want this to start within 20 seconds, 95% of the time. Why 95% instead of 99% like these other ones? Well, we find that having 99% is too expensive and it doesn't have enough value. And to get to 99%, we have to have larger idle pools. And like seen in the spreadsheet, the larger the idle pools, the more expense. <clears throat> Last is errors. How many errors are normal? And this is a really tricky question because 
when we look at failed uh, pipeline jobs, they can fail for reasons due to the, the executor, infrastructure, or the developer's code. We have a simple idea that if more than 12 jobs fail per minute, there's a problem, which sounds really high, but the way our pipelines are designed, we kick off a lot of jobs in parallel and they either usually work or they don't. So it's a pretty good metric. You have your service level objectives, but to really know if you're meeting them, you have to get data or service level indicators to see if you're meeting them. There's three main places in GitLab and the runners to get this. The first one is GitLab's API that, it, that provides all of the information on pipelines and jobs. Particularly, you want to focus in on queue duration and status. So queue duration is how long has a job waited before it started. As I showed, we have a, a slow around availability and latency, and we use this queue duration. So for instance, if queue duration is over 300 seconds, we say our system is not available. We also use this for latency that if jobs need to start in under 20 seconds, 95% of the time. Now, there's GitLab runner logs. These aren't directly used for your meeting your, your SLOs, but it will help you uh, discover errors immediately. For instance, we have alerting on any 400s or error messages in the logs. Last, there is the GitLab runners uh, Prometheus endpoint. This will help you correlate queue duration with your scaling. So this will enable you to tune your idle pools more efficiently. After you have all of this data, uh, we, and I suggest you also, put it into uh, a system like OpenSearch. And here we have a very simple dashboard. And this is allowing me to see in a glance if we're meeting uh, what we've told the business that we would do. Um, we have two runners here that we're focusing on. Um, we have our small runner here at the top, which does most of the volume. And then, and what we see here is we have, we have jobs, we have the 50th percentile, the 95th percentile, and the average. Now, the 95th percentile is really important here to us because our service level objective is that our jobs start 95% of the time in under 20 seconds. And this little red line on the very bottom is at 20 seconds. And what we can see by scanning here visually is that we're more or less meeting that. Now, the graph below it, we're starting to see that the service level objective is much higher. Now, this is a, a, a special case where this runner, we don't have a very big idle pool. So we say that we can take up to you know, 200 seconds or more for a job to start. Now, at the very top is something we can see at a glance if we're meeting our uh, latency and availability. So the left gauges with the red and green show how long on average things have waited. So we can see here, our general jobs are taking six seconds to start. Um, on the right part is availability. We can see here that we have had 15 jobs though in the last uh, 24 hours that didn't meet our availability. Luckily though, the average queue duration is 317 seconds, which is just a little over our 300 seconds that we've established for our service level objective of availability. Here's some further resources for you to look into runners for yourself. Um, today, I hope you got to see why you might run your own GitLab runners, even if you have GitLab SaaS, and how you do it. Thank you.